Welcome to Lutheran Church of the Holy Spirit Worship Online, and thank you for continuing to make this a part of your spiritual journey. It's good for me to be back. My wife and I took a little vacation and spent some time out in California and then off in Hawaii. So it's good to be back with you again this week. We have been providing worship online for over almost three years now, and we are continuing to wonder what next steps might be. I also want to mention that Sarah, who has been a part of our online journey for the last three years, this will be her last Sunday with us as a part of Lutheran Church of the Holy Spirit Worship Online. She has a new gig she's doing with the Synod, and so we will miss you, and you have been a huge part of making this viable and helping to set up how we do this online worship service. So a huge thank you for your ministry online and in the office over the last four years and three years online. We will miss you. Now I'd like to invite you to light a candle in your space as a visible symbol and a reminder of the Holy Spirit's presence and partnership in our lives and in our work in the world. Jesus begins his ministry after John is arrested, potentially alarming, a potentially alarming scenario from that new preacher in town. So with the backdrop of occupation and oppression, Jesus proclaims a message of good news and he asks people to come and follow me. Given the political situation, saying yes to Jesus' call was not easy. How do we say yes to Jesus' call? And what does following Jesus mean for our decisions and our lives? The invitation is open to every person. It is God's invitation. Come, follow me. We come to worship hoping to follow in Jesus' footsteps. In the name of Christ, we accept the invitation to discipleship. In the name of Christ, we worship and praise God. In the midst of a world where cruelty and injustice abound, we proclaim God's great compassion. In the midst of despair that threatens to swallow lives, we proclaim God's hope. In the midst of division and distrust, we proclaim God's love. Come. Come, let us worship together. Teach us to be God's living presence in the world. Jesus and His glory. Uh -huh. 
power of your love, you shatter our darkness, scatter our fears, and set us free to live as your children. Give us courage and conviction that we may joyfully follow you into new adventures of faithful service, led by the light that shines through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Our first reading for today comes from Isaiah, chapter 9. There will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, the Lord brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the later time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. <laughs> in my salvation, whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I ask of the Lord, one thing I see, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek God in the temple. For in the day of trouble, God will give me shelter. Hide me in the hidden places of the sanctuary, and raise me high upon a rock. Even now my head is lifted up above my enemies who surround me. Therefore I will offer sacrifice in the sanctuary, sacrifices of rejoicing. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice, O Lord, when I call. Have mercy on me and answer me. My heart speaks your message, seek my face. Your face, O Lord, I will seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not away from your servant in anger. Cast me not away, you have been my helper. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. A gospel lesson comes from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulon and Naphtali, so that what he had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is also called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And as he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called to them. Immediately then they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. When we consider the Bible, the Bible, 
Each one of us might have a few different explanations and ideas of what the Bible is, who the Bible is for, and how it should or shouldn't be used. One of my favorite ways of explaining the Bible, especially when I'm working with younger people, confirmation age or, or younger children, the Bible is God's story and our story. Well, today we can take a look at how the Bible is also full of beginnings. Not only the universal one, when God speaks into existence and the components of this magnificent cosmos, but countless other beginnings as well. Consider the next beginning in the beginning of the book, the Old Testament, where the story is told of the human race beginning with Adam and Eve and then beginning again after the flood with Noah and Noah's family. And then in old age, this person Abraham answers the invitation of God to go away from his home and to begin anew. The Bible presents us with beginnings over and over again until at the end in the book of Revelation, there is this holy city coming down from heaven to earth and its name is not Jerusalem, but New Jerusalem because it is a place to begin. It is the start of what will be forever new. Some of the beginnings in the Bible are known as call stories. There's a call story that recounts how somebody was invited by God to begin something new and unexpected. God calls this person to begin, and not only to begin, but, and here's the hard part, to persist, to persist so that another beginning can take place. Well, one day, Andrew and Simon and James and John, they get up when the sky is still dark and they walk down to the sea and, and they hurl their nets out into the water anticipating a catch of fish. Some days it happened, some days it didn't. It's a day like so many other days. It's really nothing special. These men were engaging in this same routine hundreds and hundreds of times before. This is what they do, and we don't really need to ask why they do this. They do it time and time again because they're fishermen, plain and simple, period, stop. So amid the familiar water and the nets and the fresh fish, rough wood of the boats and the rhythmic motion of the waves in the midst of this familiarity, these four men, a beginning takes place. Jesus turns up at the waterside. Have they met him before? Have they heard about him? We don't know. And it really doesn't matter. Today, as he calls them, a new beginning takes place. He glances at these working men with their nets and their hard-won catch, and he announces in this voice, almost comic, the way that men kid one another. Hey, follow me and I'll make you fish for people. The four hear this as maybe a put-down or a dare or a challenge from this landlubber carpenter who is on shore. And like every other call story in the Bible, this one is an adventure. Well, the legendary author G.K. Chesterton had an intriguing definition of adventure. He stated, an adventure is by its nature a thing that comes to us. It is a thing that chooses us, not a thing that we choose. An adventure is by its nature a thing that comes to us. It's a thing that chooses us, not a thing that we choose. So back in Jesus' day, 
there were many, many renowned rabbis or teachers of this Jewish tradition and this Jewish theology. And one of the traditions of all the rabbis was that it was a tradition that they would wait for disciples to come to them. Teacher, I want to study under you. So what's going on in this beginning? This rabbi, this teacher, Jesus, goes out and finds his own. And he doesn't go looking for disciples among the likely candidates that you would think, the ones that are the best and the brightest. He goes down to the dock where he interrupts fishermen while they are at work. An adventure is something that comes to us, that chooses us. Discipleship is the great adventure, don't you think? The one who comes to us and chooses us is great beyond all measure. We are taken away from predictable lives and ready or not, we are plunged into adventure. And it almost seems to go unnoticed. Woe to anyone who dilutes this adventure with dullness, who makes discipleship into something safe. Happy are those for whom the adventure remains forever sharp, who find themselves always at a new beginning. Are these four men, Andrew, Simon, James, and John, are they ready and equipped for the adventure that comes to them, that, that chooses them, this adventure of discipleship? Jesus at the waterside doesn't go about collecting resumes. He doesn't even check those references. The personal histories of these four men do not have the last word about their future. You see, Jesus' Jesus call means a new beginning. He takes a wide open risk by inviting these four and by inviting all. They do the same in their response. And if you read through the Gospels, in event after event after event, the story after story, these people who are followers, they don't demonstrate that they are particularly fit for this call. Simon, who will come to be known as Peter, he betrays Jesus in an even more bold-faced way than all of the rest of those followers. James and John, they're nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. Not the most agreeable pair to have around. They indulge in dreams about their own enthronement, missing the point completely when Jesus announces that downward mobility really is the path to the kingdom. Andrew rarely appears again in, on, on the radar in, in, the, in these four books, and maybe his flaw is playing it safe. Yet Jesus never withdraws his invitation to any of them to share in this adventure. And he part and partners with Jesus is what they finally become as we move 2,000 years beyond Jesus' resurrection. The novelist James Baldwin once wrote, Any real change implies the breakup of the world as one has always known it, the end of safety. The call to discipleship of these four fishermen, the beginning of their story, represents it. It implies the breakup of their familiar world. It implies the end of their safety. They leave behind old securities, the waterside, the boat, the nets, these days of fishing that so resembled one another, and they even leave behind old Zebedee, the father of James and John, standing astonished in the boat as his two sons suddenly walk away. The new beginning requires this. Disciples must walk away into the future, they may be afraid, but not so afraid that their faith 
does not lead them forward. The Bible tells us of this beginning for the four fishermen. They are called out from their occupation about which they know this huge amount in order to fish for people about which they claim no knowledge whatsoever. In the same way, our discipleship means a new beginning, one that appears before us again and again, and we keep experiencing the end of safety so that we may participate in this new world. We find ourselves engaged in an adventure for however strangely, however unjustifiably, Jesus the Christ comes to us, chooses us, and sends us out to be the next new beginning in the world. Thanks be to God. southern hemisphere, fallow fields in the northern hemisphere. Equip farmers to till and keep the earth sustainably. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Break the rod of the oppressor in every nation. Dispel the shadow of death in the Ukraine and other places of war, conflict, and persecution. Grant us leaders who lift the yokes that burden those in need. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Be a stronghold for those in trouble in Iraq for all who are afraid. Rouse communities to care for neighbors who need shelter, are facing maltreatment, or are isolated and lonely. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Today we pray for Merle, Joseph, Lil, and all we name now with our lips or in our hearts. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Sustain the ministries of this congregation in all communities of faith. Nurture our unique gifts, foster mutual respect, and inspire cooperation in loving our neighbors. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We bring to you our needs and our hopes, O oh God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. Amen. And now receive this blessing. May the God who faithfully brings forth justice and breaks the oppressor's rod, may this God bless, strengthen, and uphold you today 
and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Follow in the way of Jesus. Thanks be to God.